the University of Michigan Division of Gastroenterology and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program host the IBD Visiting Professor Lecture Series in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This series presents the latest in clinical research and basic science from IBD experts from around the world. Thank you all for, for joining me this early in the morning. We're going to talk about the importance of being earnest, the, uh, the issue of adherence in IBD. And I think that, that anybody in the room who doesn't do IBD can certainly take away some of these messages for their own practices and adherence in, in whatever field of, of medicine that they practice. So, okay, good thing uh, I don't have to worry about Kaspersky viruses today. All right, so we're going to talk about adherence. We're going to talk about some general data regarding non-adherence. We're going to talk about IBD-specific non-adherence, and I'm going to walk you through a story, uh, in, particularly in ulcerative colitis. I'm going to avoid Crohn's today. It just gets too muddy. And I am going to use brand names, and the reason that I'm going to do that is because it does become important in terms of the FDA indications for certain things and, 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 uh, and how you dose them. So... When I, will, when I can, I will use generic names, but other times it's appropriate for me to use brand names. So I'll just tell you that up front. We're going to talk about the implications of non-adherence. And then just uh, I'm going to wrap up with my most recent uh, work that I just presented at DDW looking at, at another way to look at non-adherence. So back in 400 BC, Hippocrates said, the physician must not only be prepared to do what is right himself, but to make the patient cooperate. So back then, we recognized the importance of patients trying, of doing what they say. And it was two millennium later that C. Everett Koop, our esteemed uh, Surgeon General said, drugs don't work in patients who don't take them. So when, it's, when I say it, it's, well, you know, no, no kidding. But when he says it, it's, you know, deep philosophy. So I think that this is the bad outcome that we're all trying to avoid in our patients. And we think that, that the way to do that is to have them take their medicine. So for you in the audience, why should you care about this? Why is Dr. Kane up here and, and why did I come this morning? Well, it turns out that the Office of Ongoing Professional Practice Evaluation, or the OPPE, uh, have, have initiatives that are being developed to include patient outcomes and adherence in credentialing, in board recertification, and in career benchmarking. So these, these are terms and, and philosophies that are coming to a neighborhood toward, uh, near you, and so even if you don't do IBD, if you do something else, that you're going to have to prove that, you're, that you've at least discussed with your patients adherence, how to improve it, and the consequences of non-adherence. So the National Quality Forum also, the NQF, is, is now deeply involved in IBD, but back in 2005, the, the official report came out and was published, and two of the goals of that were to improve medication adherence by creating standards to change the way that healthcare professionals interact with patients, and to develop standard performance measures that could be implemented in patient care settings to improve adherence. And in speaking with Arden Morris uh, yesterday, She's actually got an R01 grant to look at how, how surgeons interact with patients and their behaviors towards getting chemotherapy, which I thought was really fascinating. So the recommendations, these are very lofty goals, so the recommendations right now were that adherence needs to be evaluated like a vital sign. So we know that you know, now pain is another vital sign, but maybe adherence needs to be, where every time the patient is seen, either the nurse or the doctor or whoever the healthcare professional is, is asking, are you taking your medications? And how do you ask that? Well, it's are you taking it, how are you taking it, and what's your dose? So we know that adherence is complex and multifactorial. This is a brilliant review by uh, Dr. Osterberg, published in New England Journal a few years ago, and I'm not going to go through every one of these little facets of the, of the diagram, but just to show you how many areas you can actually get involved with and that any one of these spokes off this wheel could be an entire career, uh, just looking at one of these aspects of adherence. So we're not going to go uh, too deeply into any one of those things, but suffice to say that, that, uh, that we do a smattering of all of those things. So let's start with a definition. What is adherence? So adherence is actually made up of two components. It's compliance, which is what we're all used to thinking about, uh, which is medication consumption as instructed, and it's basically the percentage of pills that you take. So that's what we think about when we talk about our patients being compliant. But you can be compliant today, 
but are you compliant three weeks from now? So that's the concept of persistence. So you could be compliant for two weeks. Anybody could take two pills twice a day when they have acute sinusitis. But what about three months from now when now your ulcerative colitis is not active and you're being asked to take these pills? That's persistence. So adherence is compliance plus persistence. So there's a time factor in there. And we measure adherence historically by this medication possession ratio, or MPR. And that takes into account both of these aspects of adherence. So the challenges that we face in adherence really come down to a couple of things. So we, un we have to understand, first of all, that our patients are not going to take everything that we prescribe and that they're going to decide what they're going to take on any given basis. So that maybe we have to be strategic in our counseling of non-adherence. So you can't afford XYZ drug today. Okay, well, it's more important that you take X if you have to skip Y than, you know, than do that. And be mindful that this is the reality that we need to try to systematically minimize the number and doses of pills that the patients are taking, and that we want to try to promote the use of beneficial therapies and reduce the use of less beneficial ones. So, you know, the patients come in with their long list of, of the supplements that they are taking. So they're on 12 supplements and can't possibly take one medication that, they, that you want to give them because it's just too many pills, but they're already taking 12 on their own. And then the, the, this concept of polypills, where there's two or three medications in the same formulation. So, for example, Pylera for H. pylori contains metronidazole and a PPI. So maybe you can combine a couple of things together and, and make it simpler. And then there's improving communication between the healthcare providers and the patients which it ultimately comes down to awareness of the problem by healthcare providers. And we're going to talk about this concept of interval empathy and how that really becomes important as I show you the data and these, uh, these repeating signals in, in the data. And then health literacy. So you can be very educated, but you look at a prescription bottle and you can interpret it several different ways. And I'm going to show you a very good example of, of health literacy in patients. So... I hope this projects okay. This is taken directly with permission from the authors from an article that just appeared a couple of months ago in Archives of Internal Medicine. So what the investigators did was they, they took a, a, a cohort of patients who were elderly, who had multiple uh, medical problems, and were given a theoretical regimen of seven different medications that were all appropriate for that cohort. And there on the far left is the regimen that is recommended based on the combination of all of these seven medications and the times that you're supposed to take them, okay? So that the recommended regimen is four times a day that you are taking uh, some number of pills. That was the easiest way that you could combine seven pills. And then what they did was they asked the patients to look at the prescription bottles and figure out how they were going to take their seven medications. And then they just plotted how they were going to do this. And so if you look at patient number one, they interpreted it that they were going to need to take some pill eight times a day. Patient number two said 10 times a day. Patient three, 12 times a day. And then the far end is patient number four, who had to take something 14 times a day. So these are all patients who have support at home, have some at least a level of 8th grade, if not 12th grade education, and they just can't understand the instructions on the bottles, and they're ending up taking a medication basically every hour that they're awake during the day. So health literacy is a big deal. All right, so in terms of communication with our patients, there's this concept of interval empathy, where that, that it's important that a healthcare provider be interacting with a patient on a regular basis, even when the patient is well, just so that there's communication on a regular basis so that patient feels plugged in or tucked into the system and that they feel like their doctor cares about them. And I'm going to show you why this might be important. And, and depending on what disease you're talking about, this interval empathy may be on a weekly basis, it may be on a monthly basis, it may be on an annual basis. So that's something that needs to be negotiated, but I'm going to show you where I think interval empathy is helpful in ulcerative colitis.